The Vic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, okay. The Vic. The Vic. The Vic. Yes, sir. Right. Mm -hmm. Sir Williams. Yes, sir. Good. 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 How are you? Hi, nice to meet you. Hi. Daniel How are you? Josh is not here? <laughs> no, no, no. And we're also waiting to go out with one of our other colleagues, Mr. Jerry Weber, because of the parking issue, he'll be here in a moment. Okay. All right. Do you have his name out front? Yeah. 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 In terms of our getting better by more every day. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about my background because I think that uh, it may have been lost in some of the flurry and some of the things that are going on, some of them are political in nature. <coughs> but uh, as you may know, not only me, but I'm also a pastor. And uh, I pastored the church for 38 years. <coughs> and I think it's important for you to know because a lot of ideas and values of what I do line up with some of your ideas and values. Uh, we um, feed the hungry. We have a closed closet for people to get close. Um, we operate as CDC, Community Development Corporation, <coughs> and we uh, have built 38 units, 60, I'm sorry, units of affordable housing for people sitting in on Wall Street, an area that's being rebuilt and we did not do that and poor people would not have a place to, to live on, on Wall Street. Uh, also spent 15 years in the General Assembly of Virginia. <coughs> and if you check the record of my legislative record, uh, I've always been on the side of uh, social justice issues and on the side of uh, people who are uh, what I call sometimes the least and, and the uh, left out. And, and I, I know you have your issue, and I'm going to get to that, but I think it's important for you to know why. Uh, and then, uh, as mayor, <clears throat> we have really taken seriously core values of economic development and economic reciprocity. And we're building a jail, and in that jail we have 50%, 50.2% 50 <clears throat> minority uh, participation building schools and we have 40% minority participation in the schools that we're building. Um, the city of Richmond has a 22% poverty rate, which means one in five people in the city of Richmond makes below uh, $15,300 a year families, $15,300 uh, $15, a year. So that means one in five people are on board. This is the first administration that's put together an anti-poverty commission. And that anti-poverty commission is trying to be innovative and not just come up with programs, but come up with ways to change the picture of poverty in the city of Virginia. <clears throat> and we want to do it with an eye toward economic uh, justice, by getting oh, jobs for people Sorry. and people to uh, make a living. And any Anything that we put money into in the city of Richmond we require that uh, those persons provide jobs for uh, people who are underemployed or uh, unemployed. For instance, on the jail, uh, the contractor that we have uh, chosen, the developer we've chosen, has a on site welding unit that they will bring onto the site. And so when they leave, we'll have a building, but we'll also have some people who will be welders. So they'll be able to uh, uh, not only ask for uh, some money or ask for some help, but they'll be able to be gainful and poor. So I just thought uh, that was important for me to tell you a little bit about who I am, because I, I don't know whether or not uh, that's been transmitted or translated, or whether you've done the research, and that doesn't show up on the Google search. Uh, so with that, uh, we're delighted to, that you've come today and uh, I look forward to kind of dialoguing with you on my anti-poverty commission. As I read about you, it seems that our values line up on that 
And one of the things I wanted to say to you is that if you would like to add one of your people to uh, uh, serve on that commission, I'd be more than happy to, to offer that to you. We also just received a report on homelessness. And uh, I would be delighted to allow you to peruse that, to see it, and to make comment on it. And uh, those are two things that we're dealing with right now that uh, we'd like very much to um, involve you in if you so choose. You may not want to do that. <clears throat> but those are things that uh, line up with, uh, <clears throat> it seems that your, your issues are. So with that, uh, I will listen to you. <clears throat> um, well, I think I can speak for us all and say that we're really happy to have opened up this dialogue with you. Um, we have been limited by our governing body, the General Assembly, to speak only on the issue of our First Amendment um, interests in actually occupying public space. Um, we definitely appreciate the, um, these, these options and we would definitely bring them to GA because they are very much what we're looking for. Um, but we, we just wanted to, I guess, start a dialogue about um, what our possible uh, communications can be about having a set occupation that isn't um, out in Southside, that actually is in, um, in the city so that we can start building a community um, there and start helping to gather support for these exact type of initiatives. Um, so I guess that's back to you as um, exactly what, I mean, we were familiar with the statutes, um, yeah. but I guess we kind of want to know what our options are. Sure. Yeah, and, and, and uh, uh, if you'll recall, I came to Canal Plaza and, and met with you, and um, uh, at that time um, offered or extended the invitation for you to come talk with me. And um, on Monday night, when you all came to city council meeting, um, it's been interpreted as a snub uh, because I left city council meeting. But anybody on this side of the table will tell you I've never stayed for an entire council meeting. <laughs> the law does not require me to, and I don't do, do it. I was there on Monday night because of the importance of the jail vote for me. But even if you had asked me to meet with you, uh, I would have uh, extended you an invitation to do what we're doing today. This is how we do meetings, uh, meetings with the mayor. And also, I'm not a member of city council. so. Uh, that's not the perfect form. <laughs> that being said, um, the the ordinances are, are there. I mean, the ordinances are uh, what they are. And you're familiar with them, you've written, and you have um, identified and referenced the various uh, ordinance numbers and code numbers. And you met Alan, um, who was our um, city attorney, who was here uh, as well. Um, I took an oath of office, and in that oath of office, I <coughs> promised to uphold the ordinances and the laws of the state of Virginia City of Richmond. So I have to do that. Um, Festival Park is a place where you can go until 3 o'clock in the morning, but you know that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other parks, you know what the law is at rate as it relates to that. I think the biggest takeaway for you today is that council, only council can change the ordinances. I think that's the biggest takeaway for you. And the ordinances, um, if changed, provide a framework whereby some of the things you're talking about might be able to happen. Um, I appreciate everything you're saying, but we, uh, we personally believe, and I can speak really only for myself, but in a meeting before this, um, we personally believe that the First Amendment actually trumps city ordinance, and that's not to offend you by any means, but we, we just kind of believe that the First Amendment does. And just, just to correct you a little bit, is you, we actually were under the uh, impression that you were going to send representatives to us, because that's what you said at Kanawha. You said, I'll send representatives to you, and then we never got any representatives sent to us. So I just wanted to let you know that that might be why the communication got lost a little bit. It's just, just wording. I, 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 think, I think that we, do have, we did have a communication. Yeah, I, I believe we did as well. Um, and not to monopolize the conversation, so I won't let everybody speak, but um, 
there are city councils in this country that have actually adopted an interpretation of the First Amendment that helps us both, I think. Um, in Irvine, California, their city council voted that um, in the context of these occupation movements, the erecting of encampments in order to convey a particular political message is actually pure symbolic speech, akin to the black armbands that were protected by the Supreme Court. Um, if possible for your administration of the city council to adopt that sort of an interpretation, that gets us past this impasse that we have with, um, with, with this, I mean, we know that the rule of law is important. It's foundational in our society. Um, so we don't want to tell you not to do your job, but we want to help. We want to create a dialogue so that perhaps we can get past this, you can't do what we need you to and we can't do what you need us to. So that's an option. And, and, and again, you're right, that's an option. But I can't pass it along. And so even if the interpretation that you say, if we use the broad interpretation, it would have to be something the council would have to deal with. So, or, or the city attorney would have to chime in on. And I guess what I'm saying is that the direction of the dialogue has got to include city council because at the end of the day, you need five people who are going to stand up and do something if anything's going to be done. We have no problem involving city council, but in a, there, are, there are other st um, cities, in, is it Orange County, where the mayor actually deemed the tents um, as a symbol of protest, so it was the mayor, the mayor. And I'm not sure if, if that's something that you could possibly do, even just as um, in support, like just saying that, that we see these as symbols of protest and not as actual, and not as encampment um, violations. Um, so there's something, I mean, there's a couple of ways around it. I just think that a, a level of creativity has to be had. Because we don't, we don't really plan on. There's so many different forms of government. Yeah. And we have no problem going to city council. We yeah. will go to city council as well. Our form of government here uh, has the uh, symbol of a strong man. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's basically a mayor at large. Mm -hmm. And um, with uh, not a lot of executive, uh, not a lot of executive power, okay. and that is not something that I'm crazy about. But that's the hand I'm in. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, well, when we were uh, off back in our plaza, uh, wasn't it you that held off the police for coming in? I did. Not only did I hold them off, uh, I um, required that they be conciliatory in the way that they dealt with the occupation tried to make sure that we did not have um, situations like we've been reading about in other cities. So you interject yourself, extended. There are areas where I do have some authority, but there are other areas where I don't have authority. And uh, with the police, I do have a little bit of authority. And on that point, though, you should understand that even with that leniency that the mayor called for, there was a lot of pushback that the mayor got from other members of city council that he should not have allowed that from other groups who have now demanded a refund because of their what they consider disparate treatment. So there are certain parameters within which sure. there are some things that can be done, but even that can only go sure. so far. It's understood that um, this social movement can be denied. Um, a, a child of the civil rights movement you should understand how important this time is. And, um, Unfortunately for your position, if I say, um, Minister and Mayor, you know, they've got to my kids, both of them. And um, I respect that, but at the same time, uh, the social movement can't be denied, and um, it's taking place. And, you know, so we must find that medium where we can, as to say, get, get us to un understand that we don't want chaos in the street, but um, the revolution is being talked about. I hear you. I hear you. I would also just like to chime in. Um, I was very happy to see that you clearly share some of our values. Um, and I understand the pressure that you're under from other interests. But um, I think one of the things that we has been finding foundational for us is that we haven't taken a comfortable, safe route in trying to get these issues out here. We've taken a very, we, we, we've, we've interrupted normal life for some people. We have, we have gotten a message out there that, and, and a way of getting that message out there that is a little bit disruptive, maybe. Um, it's not comfortable, it's not safe. I would just ask that if you do indeed share our values, that 
may be a safe and comfortable route of dealing with this isn't, isn't the right way. We've, we've demonstrated that we're willing to take a little risk. Are you willing to take a little political risk to further these values, perhaps? Uh, I am bound by my responsibility to uphold the law. I'm the mayor of the city of Virginia. And so, and so uh, that's, that's the, the bottom line of, of what, I, what I have to do. Um, there are different ways to achieve uh, the ends that we're talking about. You've chosen to do it in one way. I choose to do it 365 days a year through my congregation in another way. And anybody who tells me that we're not affecting change, I'll tell them that they're not telling the truth. Because we have people living in the apartments that we have built who would not be living there, who might be homeless, who might be in a public housing if we had not taken that stance. When we open up our clothes closet, people come and grab those clothes out like they're gold. You know, and so we've been a beacon light in the community for years and for years and for years. And so I reject uh, the proposition that I have not taken risks. Um, or, or I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure if that's what Jeremy was saying, but we do, I do, I do take a little bit of issue, and this is a personal statement. Um, I, I appreciate the clothes closet, and I, I appreciate the homelessness activity and all that stuff, but um, we were under the impression, and I'm not really sure, I can't even remember where, where I'm getting this back in my head because I have so much in my, in my, in my brain right now, but that we would be able to clean up Kanawha, and we were given 45 minutes. Had we been given the opportunity we would have taken that stuff to homeless shelters and to your clothes closet, perhaps, but instead it was put in dumpsters. And there's lots of blankets, clothing, medical supplies, uh, books, all types of stuff that could have gone to your, these programs, but instead were chosen to be thrown in the dump. Um, now let, me, let me ask you this, because it was my understanding that you were given 15 minutes, mm -hmm. but that nothing happened for 45 minutes. Oh, that's very incorrect. We, and we have a lot of footage of it if you'd like to see it. Um, actually, uh, not to, not to no, speak no, out of turn, please. but actually we sent video um, mm -hmm. of proof of what was destroyed, of our actions to get stuff out of Kanawha, and also of the police actions. I think there were a lot of tents that were slashed with, uh, with box cutters. We have footage of everything, and we sent that all to Major Drew um, at his request um, because we, um, we were given about 15 minutes and there were only a few of us in the park and everyone who wasn't in the park was held off on the sidewalk and told that once those people in the park were able to leave, that, those, that we, those of us on the sidewalk would be able to go back in the park and get our belongings. And before we were able to go back in the park and get our belongings, we were told no one else would be entering and the bulldozers came and bulldozed all the rest of the property. Um, Could I ask you to do something? Absolutely. Would you send it directly to me? I would. Footage. Yes, of course. Um, you could send it to my email address. It's on my heart. I, I will send it directly to you. Um, not that I, I don't know if this is, I mean, I, this is something we want you to be fully informed of. Um, but, I mean, at this point, that's done and it's over and it's happened and it's time to move towards um, us creating a, a new dialogue between us. Um, I have a clarifying question very quickly. Um, as to the interpretation of the, the, um, the encampment citation. Is that something that the city attorney is capable of putting out, that the city attorney is interpreting the statute in this manner? I mean, not that you would be willing to, but is that possible um, to? To me, that seems like an issue of, you know, statute, statutorial interpretation and not an issue of legislative action. So, I mean, this might be something that doesn't have to go through city council. This might be something that is said, we think that, at least in reference to the encampment law, that we can deem this to be freedom of speech, and that gets us both away from having to worry about the enforcement of that statute. There might be occasions when uh, an interpretation of an existing ordinance uh, could go in more than one direction. Uh, there might be uh, situations where, uh, in fact, an ordinance uh, on its face conflicts with the First Amendment. Uh, this, these cases, in my opinion, are not either of those cases. So it's my view that 
uh, any relief that you might want, as the mayor suggested, uh, would need to come from city council. If I may, was that was that also your opinion on the original noise ordinance that was being unconstitutional? I wasn't here. Oh, okay. All right. So um, there is history of ordinances being ruled unconstitutional. Oh, sure, that happens yeah. all the time. Yeah. I and, and and I am not arrogant enough to suggest to you <laughs> that it couldn't happen in this case. What I am suggesting to you is that, in my opinion, it would not happen in this mm -hmm. case. That is my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I think the safest route is to get city council to change the law. Well, I think another thing, too, mm -hmm. something the mayor said, we highlighted, um, there's an amount of discretion that any executive branch has. I mean, you know, obviously a, a police officer doesn't have to stop every person that he or she sees speeding. You know, the fact that they stop one speeder and not another all by itself isn't enough. But there are limits to that discretion. And then at that point in time, your sworn duty to enforce the law does kick in. Mm -hmm. So I think what the mayor has demonstrated and we told you is he has exercised a degree of discretion. And there has and continues to be pushback on the price that's paid for that. Um, but that is, in my opinion, within those bounds of discretion. Now, you, you can't just ignore a law for forever. But those are discretionary things, not, I'm not going to. You don't have the option to not. You do have the option within bounds to have. And that's, I think, what our history up to this point has been. Well, we have um, we've got tens of thousands of dollars that have been spent by the city government on quality free speech. Um, last Wednesday, we remained uh, other than the two arrests that we had, which were, that, that was our personal choice not to, to take off their, their face. We, we remained legal the entire night, and I'm not sure what you guys spent, but I would imagine that it would be quite a bit of money. And um, when we went to Monroe Park and we were around, we stayed on the sidewalks and we were marching around Monroe Park, we have footage of many people just walking around in the park. So we were stopped because we were going to go in and talk. And that to, to us is a, a, a direct violation of the First Amendment, because why were they allowed to be in the park after dark if it's all about sunset laws? And yet, we're being stopped at the entrances because we're going to go in and say something. I think if you all read the laws now, they'll just better not. The ordinances specifically say under what circumstances, you know, people can be in the park after dark with the sidewalks and streets mm -hmm. and passing through. And the ordinances are very clear on what's allowed on that. So, you know, people can go through the park. So, People were sitting in the park. Yeah, no, that's when you get to the And they were being arrested. You can go through. You can use the sidewalks. Go through. You can use the roads to go through. But we weren't allowed to enter there. Right, so we never had the opportunity to demonstrate. Yeah, I mean, that's because we were going to speak. That's a direct violation of First Amendment. That you guys, that the city government are spending money on to violate First Amendment rights. And then chase us around the city to violate First Amendment rights. Harassing us in the park when we were there legally telling us on the hour, you know, you have to leave at three. I mean, in no other circumstance would that happen, I don't think. Uh, um, if I may. Yeah. Um, it's obvious and apparent that there are some things being done there, and I do applaud mm -hmm. you for those. And my experiences, you know, historically what I've seen is there has been lines that have been obscured between the people who are subject to the legislation and the legislation themselves. I believe there needs to be a more cooperative relationship so that those of goodwill and courage in our society uh, within these communities, citywide, statewide, nationwide, and worldwide, can develop more workable relationships so that, I guess all we're saying is that we want to utilize our ability to peaceably assemble in order to be an extension of the legislation to attend to these social problems. And I believe as we continue the dialogue, not only here, but throughout history, the people will begin to learn how to develop a more cooperative relationship with the legislation so that we can do the work that's not being done at the end of a business day when lawyers go home, mayors go home, city councilors go home. We just want to be able to uh, assist in the correcting of these particular bills. Um, no, it will not, I guess, uh, cause us to morph into perfect people, but we've raised the perfect awareness of the empathy toward the value of the human condition. And I think that's the central thing 
we're utilizing our First Amendment right to peacefully assemble that petition to be able for a redress of certain grievances that are not allowing us to actually assist the legislation in, in this operation of correcting these deals. Now, I'm thinking back, um, Kennedy, go back. Kennedy was doing a lot of good things. And he was uh, for the people, trying to thank the people. Well, Martin Luther still took to the streets. We're, like he just said, we're trying. We're doing the same thing. We're not trying to cause chaos or destroy anything that's established. We're trying to assist the brain Are you cute? I am cute. <laughs> um, I wasn't aware that you were a reverend until earlier this week. And I pulled a quote off your website. Okay. And it says, the witness of the church in the community is a telling thermometer of the church's witness. And I believe that we are on the same level at some point when it comes to the social changes that need to be made. And I feel that our interaction we have now has been very, I don't wanna say hostile, but for lack of a better word, at some point. And you can become a compass in a sense. We're not asking you to take over our problems and we're not asking you to make it easier for us. But if you could point us in the direction of change, if we're going about things in the wrong way, instead of just telling us this is the wrong way, we help us do it the right way. Because we really are trying for the same thing. And there are people within the community that want the change, and they want that help, and they want to be educated in what's going around. But it seems as if every time that's attempted to be brought around, I, I, uh, I would be more than happy to, to, to continue to work with you, and I, 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 I'm glad you brought that up, because I don't want us to have a hostile relationship. Uh, I think that nothing can be accomplished when we're not talking about it. So I'm open to communication. Um, and I hope that you will involve <coughs> city council in the communication, because if anything's going to get done, it's going to require that kind of a uh, network. That's what we're going to take. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I've also done some research. I've gone online. I have looked at your anti-poverty commission announcement that was made in March. I have read the document. And you've identified rightly the need to improve education and educational attainment, <coughs> the need to improve transportation, and also enhance community life. And that's social justice, well stated. It's hard for me to reconcile that though with the disproportionate use of police force, which seems to be primarily for intimidation, which we've seen. It's also been documented by Mayor Kwan's interview with the BBC that there was a nationwide conference call with 18 mayors and the Department of Homeland Security that was clearly meant to send a message. We've also seen rollbacks of... Oh, who's Mayor Kwan? The Mayor of Atlanta. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. surprised you don't know that. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I followed what has happened there, but I don't know Mayor Kwan personally. And it didn't want to die, so... If I She's under a lot of heat for... Yeah. And, and actually, her legal advisor stepped down. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Because he was very much upset with the way that she overstepped. Um, and inappropriately dealt with the public on these very serious issues, these multiple crises that we face. I'm not mistaken, there were violent interactions with police in the business. There were violent interactions from the police. From the police. Well, yes. yes. Very violent. Yeah. Very violent. Someone, someone died. <laughs> I, I and mean, someone was in a coma. Yes. 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 Scott Olson. Scott Olson. Um, so, right. I, 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 applaud, I applaud your uh, identification as a child of civil rights. I don't think one necessarily had to have been born in the 40s or 50s or 60s to call oneself a child of civil rights. I think we're all beneficiaries of that system. Mm -hmm. Or we've all uh, learned from those traditions. And I think we're all students here of Howardson, which, uh, whose book Sir brought. I think we're also all students of Dr. King. I'm an atheist, but I consider Dr. King to be one of the most 
genuine, courageous people and he's a hero of mine. And so to hear you state that you're a child of, of civil rights and then you have hope that a Blue Ribbon Commission will solve the roots or solve the problems of poverty seems a little, um, I don't want to use the word naive, but you should know better that there have never been commissions which have investigated the roots of poverty in a way that would benefit the public. You should know that, as Howard Zinn points out, change always comes from the bottom up, whether it's been labor unions or it's been um, working conditions for factory workers or children or women's rights. It's always been a populist movement. And so I understand your current executive position as mayor. I respect that you've um, served your state for numerous years, as well as your parish. And we, we, we certainly applaud that, but we also have empathy for you, because in this position that you currently um, occupy, pardon the pun, <laughs> um, we, we, we understand that you are under pressure, political pressure, and, and that we have this very right-wing party which, although its ideologies and policies and proposals and analyses have been discredited by the world, as evidenced by this global Occupy movement, well, it's, it's still there. And so we would like for you to take a stand. Take a stand um, and, and show that you really stand for human rights. I'm not talking about this limited document of the Constitution. I'm talking about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. Which, 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 which looks at human rights in five dimensions. Cultural rights, social rights, economic rights, civil rights, and political rights. And I think if you, if you do value the, these public spaces and our, the need for us to be able to, to dialogue and dissent in those public spaces at all times, if you recognize the need for the public sphere and the need to defend that. And if you really want to make Richmond a safe space for democracy, we would like to see more. But at the same time, we recognize that you are limited. You are constrained. And as students of Howard's and, and Dr. King, we are going to take to the streets whether or not we get city council's approval. We will have to because that's the only way that change will actually Well, I certainly happen. understand that. But I'm not going to let you defame my participation and my past. Please explain that. Because when I say I'm a child of the civil rights, I'm not talking about being born in a certain time period. I'm talking about participating in selective patronage programs in the city of Philadelphia where I was born, where we brought companies to their knees. I'm talking about marching in Washington. I'm talking about being in college during the time of the greatest civil unrest of the countries at the moment. So, so I don't know what you meant by that. The second thing is that I'm not naive. I didn't get where I am today by being naive. Okay. So as we have civil dialogue, we have to choose our words appropriately. Of course. So that we understand each other. Uh, I think that you may not choose to work at change the way I choose to work at change. And I may not choose to work at change the way you choose to work at change. But if we're all working at it together, maybe change will take place. And so I'm working at change through constraints of government, which is difficult. It's bureaucratic. But it's the hand that we have been dealt, because this is the, the system that is in place. And it would seem to me that you would be comforted in knowing that there's somebody in government that is trying to make these wheels turn, even though they turn ever so slowly. But as you agitate and protest and so forth and so on, then there's a way that those things kind of come together. And there is a ton tangential kind of a, uh, uh, overlap where there are common interests. Okay. Yes. Um, you stated you were in child of the civil rights, not being born, but being a participant. Right. And that we should feel encouraged by the fact that we have someone with that background in office. And at one point I was, but I feel the civil rights movement, and correct me if I'm wrong because I wasn't around at the time, <laughs> was 
made up of peaceful movements and demonstrations. And you had synods where you overtook establishments and sat, preventing not only people to walk through just socially, but affecting them financially as well. And you were met with unwarranted and violent police brutality. And I felt, as with someone with that background in office, there would be, I don't want to say sympathy, but you've been there. And I feel like the way you act doesn't support your background for me to truly appreciate what you've been through. Because at some point along this line, our basic birthright got confused with privileges. Mm. And I feel as if it's causing this imbalance that just shouldn't be. And if you truly, truly took anything away from the civil rights movement, which I appreciate to this day, and it's part of the reason why I personally occupy now, because I know this isn't just for me. This is for when I'm long and gone and people that come after me as well. And I would like that cycle to be broken between peaceful protesters and peaceful movements in our relationship with our legislation and with our police force. And I don't feel like that's being done here. I feel like it's being talked about and it sounds nice. And I understand to a certain degree your hands are tied, but I also feel like some things are done extremely in excess and sometimes out of intimidation. And that's not a place either one of us wants to be because that's not what I personally stand for. I don't feel like that's what the group stands for because we have been extremely peaceful even in the wake of violence. And I feel like that's something to consider with your background. Sir. And we will remain nonviolent, of course, no matter how much violence we meet. Um, I appreciate everything that's been said, and I'm also appreciating your office as a pastor. I'm also a student of theology by way of uh, my education at Oakwood Seventh-day Adventist University. Um, what I have taken away from my studies, my biblical studies, if I may, um, is that, and I'm not indicting you saying that you or your colleagues think this way, but we understand that caring is not a business, it's an obligation based upon the empathy toward human condition. And the First Amendment allows us, as we peaceably assemble, and as we uh, collectively and consensually agree on the, if you will, best ways to deal with these particular problems, um, that it empowers us as a legitimate government body. Or it would not say that we would have the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. So in this legitimacy, I think what Hugh is saying is that we are attempting to um, dissolve those legislative and social boundaries that prevent us from actually cohering on a lot of the issues that we do share. I've had many opportunities to watch you preach, and um, I am very impressed at your wealth of knowledge theologically, your um, genuine uh, pastoral care that I see, and uh, I appeal to that because one of my one of my idols, Christ, was a man who dealt with a person's <coughs> initially. He, did, he, he just simply cared about the person rather than their issues, and I think that as I said before, as we continue to dialogue and meet and discuss these certain uh, issues, for us to find a better way to dissolve those barriers that prevent us from working together uh, cohesively, from, that prevent us from actually taking uh, instruction and guidance. Because I have no problem other than the fact that it seems to me, and I was um, detained by the Richmond Police Department, held with out by for simply peaceably assembling with my brothers and sisters, um, not to my horn while walking around the camp, reminding the officers and ourselves that we are a non-violent, non-resistant movement, and we will comply in every way, because I believe this compliance allows us not only the opportunity to express that we can't obey the law, but we can also be a law within ourselves and also work within the boundaries of it. So that's the strength, I think, that. Uh, as an individual member of Occupy Region that we bring within our collective. Well, I hope we can continue these discussions. And I'm sorry, I'm oh, cut you off. Um, I was going to say, we, we do have a way that you can lend 
us a hand um, that is well within your power. Um, we would love it if you would lend your active and vocal support to an interpretation of that law that would facilitate our being able to encamp at a public space, um, utilize an encampment as a pure symbolic form of freedom of speech. If perhaps you would lend us your active and vocal support through um, maybe issuing a statement or supporting us at city council, this might tip the scales in our favor for um, other people to recognize that what we are doing is a foundational, fundamental liberty and that that it is a prerequisite for us to address those social ills that we all want to see, um, see done away with. It's a prerequisite for us to be able to gather a community around us and educate ourselves before we try to address these problems that generations of uh, legislatures and governmental agencies have been completely ineffectual in dealing with. So, and, and I, would, I, I would conclude by saying that I, I've enjoyed talking to you. It's very, very, very good talking to you. Obviously, you've given a lot of thought to your positions and your stances, and obviously, you're very committed to what you're doing. And uh, that's um, admirable. Um, I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that we need, in, in order to change any of these ordinances, you need to have the city council, five people on city council, to, to do that. And I also would like to suggest, <coughs> as Q said, provide guidance. Um, don't allow yourselves to be used by entities that do not have your values for, for their own political gain. And allow you to become pitted against, uh, or allow you to become employees in political plots that pit people against each other, and at the end of the day, do not foster your 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 mission. Okay. What is the first tier metropolis or city look like, or what is it exactly? What are the criteria? Because I know you mentioned that as one of your aims. Sure. A first tier city is the city where we are working on ameliorating poverty. Yes. I mean, there are many other things. Transportation. You you you, you tick them off. Good education, good transportation, mm -hmm. uh, strong economic development, uh, low un unemployment, um, uh, public safety is a, clearly an important issue about that people want to have. All right. Are you a physician? I am. I graduated from this. <laughs> Actually, I have a little building right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is your heart? Psychiatry, hopefully. <laughs> Okay. So, okay. I do have a, a booklet for you. A Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I guess the um, media can ask if they could get like a snapshot of this. Is that okay? Should I let them in the room to get the photo out? I, I don't need it if you do. I mean, it depends on. I'm, I'm going to have to. I'm we gonna don't care either way. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm going to have so to. So, be happy. Let's get one. Sure. Um, so, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Did you say you didn't want to? I'm sorry. I was just no, I'm, I'm going to have to, to talk to the press. We're going to make ourselves available to be involved. Anyway. We're going to have to talk to the press as well. Do you guys mind if we stay in here and, and make our a statement really quickly bef together before we go out there? Like, you guys, you, if you just watch us over no, us. No, I don't time. mind. I won't. Just I shouldn't let them in if you want to take a few moments to do that. Yeah, that'd be good. Do, do, no. they want to, do they want to talk to us all? They want a snapshot. They just want a snapshot. That's fine. Well, so, I'll let them in. They go. No, I mean, right. Okay. <laughs> we, we've had meetings. I think I think okay. we've done some, whatever. I, 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 I'm not worried about it. I would like to thank you, and you all, yes. for, yes, thank for you. dialoguing and conversation, conversation with us, making this possible. And I want to look forward to this continuing. Um, we don't know how the GA will do as far as additions to you know some of our faces might not be a, appear again, but the, the issues will remain the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully, we'll continue to go forward. I feel good. And I appreciate. It. And uh, uh, you know, if you, if you after you have an opportunity to dialogue with some of the members of the city council, bring them into the discussion. If you want to get back with me, I'll be more than happy to do it. And I've heard your request. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They want to take a picture. Yeah, they want like this. Yeah, to. Or see aggressive. See what you do.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.